So I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight. This is uh, Jill Krasowski. And uh, she's probably one of the only people I've ever met who has done geology, both on planet Earth, uh, all over the world, and also on Mars, as you'll uh, get to hear tonight. Although I don't think she's been to Mars. But we'll, I've not uh, been there, no. We'll see. <laughs> but uh, my understanding is she, uh, she drives the camera that takes pictures on Mars. So uh, uh, without further ado, I'll uh, turn it over to you, Jill, and uh, thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, can everyone in the back hear me? Yes. Okay, I'll try to stay by the speaker, so hopefully uh, hopefully you're, you'll be able to hear me. Um, okay, uh, as Don mentioned, I have done uh, geology both on Earth and on Mars. Uh, for those of you that uh, are still trying to decide what your major is, uh, I can only um, praise the geology um, so much because uh, it's really given me some really great opportunities. Uh, I did my undergrad at, in uh, Wisconsin and I got my master's in Ontario, Canada at McMaster University. And from there I worked uh, in Pittsburgh uh, with a geotechnical company where we did uh, nuclear siting um, around the world um, looking at the geotechnical aspects of that. And then uh, I moved down to San Diego and um, being a classically trained geologist I was uh, looking for positions and I had a friend that said well why don't you check out this uh, company in Sorrento Valley called Malin Space Science Systems. And uh, Malin is a geologist and he hires geologists because uh, A, um, he likes to talk geology language to geologists and B, um, he, we work with about 450 uh, university professors on a daily basis that are all trying to do geological experiments on Mars. So um, our job is to uh, be able to communicate with those professors at a technical level and essentially be able to run their experiments on Mars. So essentially I am a glorified lab tech because I work with the professors tell me what to do and then I go and do it and then I give them the data back and they go off and write their papers with it. So it's, it's been a lot of fun. Malin um, works with a bunch of engineers who uh, we build and operate deep space cameras. So we um, are building a couple cameras for the Mars 2020 rover, which will launch in 2020. It's essentially another Curiosity type rover uh, using a lot of the spare parts for the Mars 2020 rover. Uh, we're hoping to recoup a cost of about 60% of the uh, original rover cost because we're, we're using all the same, a lot of the same designs and a lot of the, the nuts and bolts that we had originally ordered for the Curiosity rover. So uh, we uh, are building some of those cameras. We have uh, four cameras on the Mars Curiosity rover. We have the two mast cams. Uh, which are the ones at the top of the robotic mast. Uh, we operate the camera at the end of the robotic arm called the Mars Hand Lens Imager, also known as MOLLE. And uh, we also uh, built and operated the camera for the entry, descent, um, uh, and landing. Uh, when the rover entered into the Martian atmosphere, uh, we had a camera turn on and take a picture um, very quickly. So essentially we created a movie as we landed, and you can actually Google that online and see the landing. Uh, it's pretty neat, ha nice high-res imaging. Uh, first of its kind on Mars, so we're very proud of that. We also have a camera on the way to Jupiter, uh, the Juno Cam, and that should be getting there in the fall of 2016, so look for some really nice pictures of Jupiter coming up. And that's actually a really neat project because uh, majority of the pictures are going to be um, commanded, well, not commanded, they'll be commanded by us, but the public will be able to choose where they want pictures taken of Jupiter. There's a, a small percentage of pictures that we have to take of Jupiter for science reasons, but then the public can actually choose targets on Jupiter. So that's actually a really neat new education public outreach that um, we're, we're looking forward to it. Um, so look for that camera coming up. And then um, we also have uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera going around the moon and also a couple cameras that are going around Mars as well. So lots of cameras. And so we run and operate them right here in San Diego. Uh, we call in every day to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory or to the various other uh, services that we work with. And um, we coordinate and we, we take the pictures on Mars. So it's very neat and uh, it's a, a, it was a really neat opportunity. And, I'm very glad, but um, if you're interested in um, earth science or, or geology or anything like that, this is just a great example of uh, what's the sorts of things that you can do with an earth history degree. And actually there's a, a new geology program that uh, Mesa just started up, so if you are interested you can uh, look into that. There's, uh, I'm sure there's some information online about that, yes, okay. All right, so let's get started. Um, so my talk is called Satisfy Your Curiosity, an update on the Mars Science Laboratory Project. Um, 
We have been on Mars for just over two years now. We landed in August of 2012, and we've got a lot of great data um, that we've collected since then. Uh, and I'm going to be sharing some of that with you, uh, some of the initial conclusions that we found, um, and then also sort of our extended mission, where we're going. So this picture here uh, is really neat um, because we took it, it's a, it's a selfie. Many of you guys um, probably take your own selfies using your cameras, your cell phone cameras. Um, and what we did was uh, the rover has a robotic arm that sticks out, that can go out in front and actually look back, it's like a selfie stick, looking back at the rover. And uh, we actually took about 67 images uh, right in the center of this uh, photograph using the selfie. And then with that, we mosaic them together using software. Uh, anyone can do this with Photoshop or anything. You just take a bunch of photos and mosaic them together. And uh, with that, we created the mosaic. Now, can anyone see what is missing from this image? The stick, the arm. Yeah, we, you can't see the arm. Uh, you can see a little bit of the shoulder uh, the tur of the turret here, and let me let me point that out right here. You can kind of see the, the tip of it right here, the start of it. Uh, it's cool because, um, I mean, when you're taking the, the selfie with your arm, you don't actually see a large portion of your arm. And then we had the 67 positions, so um, each image had a portion of the picture without the arm in it, and we used that portion to create this picture where you didn't see the arm inside of it. So we just mosaic it out, no magic or anything, but a lot of people wonder about that. Uh, there's actually a cool video online that you can see all the different positions and, and how, that, how they work that out. Uh, the other portion of this image um, is actually taken from the mass cams. Uh, so the mass cams can go around us in a 360 degree view and take pictures of the landscape surrounding us. So we were able to mosaic the selfie together with that 360 degree view and create this really cool panorama of us on Mars. Um, the sun is not actually something that we image though. So someone put that in. Because um, we're actually, yeah, we're not really allowed to, without solar filters in place, we're not really allowed to image the sun, but it still looks pretty cool. So this is actually probably, um, probably closer to true color. Maybe it'd be a little bit more red. A lot of times we uh, white balance the images um, and that's because we make them, uh, we filter them essentially so they look like they would on Earth. Uh, so the geologists on Earth can look at the rocks and compare them to the rocks that they actually study. So a lot of times we have the, um, we use a, a pixel that looks like a, a white pixel and uh, we balance it so that it, it looks like the, the sun on Earth. Um, yeah, so um, this was taken on Sol 177. Um, Mars days are called souls, uh, and one soul is about 24 hours and 39-ish minutes long. Um, so that, that's just a fun fact. So uh, when we first landed, we actually had to uh, trace the Martian souls um, through our Earth schedule, and we ended up having to do sort of 24-hour shifts uh, to, to wake up when the rover was going to sleep. So that was a challenge for the first 90 souls of the project, but since then we have developed a lovely schedule where we get our weekends off, uh, and the rover does does its own stuff. So we tell it what to do, and we go home for the weekend, and, and then we come back and it's, it's usually done it. So it's pretty nice. <laughs> so you'll notice um, as well in the front here, there's these two little dots here. These are little drill holes that we uh, drilled. There's a drill on the end of the arm, and uh, we drilled these two little holes here uh, and got a nice little sample, which we put on board into our mass spectrometer and analyzed. Uh, what is one thing that you notice about the color of this little spot versus the rest of the surface here? It's more pale. It's actually kind of a greenish gray. It's greenish gray. And this is actually something that we're finding everywhere that we're going. If you brush away the dust or take a drill sample, everything underneath this thin dust, red, red dust layer is actually kind of a greenish gray, which is really neat. So when you think of Mars as being the red planet, you have to stop, pause, and say, wait a minute, if you just brush away that, that layer of dust, it's actually not all that red is pretty neat. Um, but I mean, we're all very excited because um, red indicates uh, rust or oxidation, uh, which means that the original um, sediment has been altered in a certain way. And so the fact that this is still kind of a greenish gray indicates that it's still in relatively original um, composition. So when we're looking for uh, evidence of life or, or uh, the ingredients for life, this means that potentially those are preserved. Uh, from back when these rocks were originally deposited. So right away, everyone was very excited about this color, even before we drilled it. Um, so, right. 
So I'll talk a little bit more about the drill holes uh, once we get going, but uh, let's go ahead and get going. I really like this picture. It's a really good introductory picture. So let's, uh, let's get oriented on Mars here. So the upper image is a digital elevation uh, model of Mars. Uh, you'll notice it's rectangular. That's because uh, we've taken um, Mars and essentially flattened it out into a rectangle, much like you would on a, a map um, on a classroom wall, which we don't have any maps of the, the world in here. Uh, but we have the North Pole up here and the South Pole down here. And we have the equator kind of right in the middle. It's zero here. And uh, we, uh, Curiosity, landed in Gale Crater, which is located right by the equator right here. Uh, it's at a really unique location because it's right along this dichotomy between this sort of red, orange, yellow layer and this really blue, flat, featureless area. And this, what is what happened up here in this blue, featureless area is still not really understood. Um, whether it was a, a impact. Um, that maybe remelted um, the the northern regions, like um, our moon was formed by a, a Mars-sized impact of Earth, um, and then was captured in our orbit. So maybe something like that happened to Mars, um, or else maybe it's just the thick ocean sediments, which have created a really smooth, uh, featureless area. Uh, so we're not really sure what's going on, but uh, Gale is right at, at the line between the two. So that was one reason why this crater was chosen. Um, the uh, white, red, and orange are the high areas, and you can see they're very cratered. Um, and it's really neat because when they were trying to figure out the geology of Mars and create a geologic time scale uh, indicating what happened first, what happened second, what happened most recently, uh, they were able to count the craters uh, and assume that the areas with the most crater impacts has been around the longest because it's been impacted the most. Uh, versus the areas that are less cratered uh, or younger in general. But overall, the hypothesis is, is that uh, Mars was very Earth-like until about 4 billion years ago. So uh, Earth um, and Mars are hypothesized to have formed about 4.5 billion years ago. So it was only 500 million years of Earth-like conditions on Mars um, that we're, we're looking at. And those are what we're really interested in is what happened to those conditions? Why is Mars no longer like Earth? Why is it so dry? Um, why did it lose its atmosphere? Um, what happened? So that's part of the reason why we're traveling up there is try to create uh, this history and uh, try to see how, you know, maybe the future of Earth, we can try to figure out what's going on with Earth uh, in our future um, or how we can avoid what happened to Mars in our future. Um, but this, these are all questions that we're hoping to answer with a little bit more data on Mars. So also on here, um, some of you might be familiar with some of the previous Mars um, landers and rovers. Uh, way up in the North Pole here, we have the Phoenix lander, um, which found ice up in the pole there. Uh, we have from the late 70s Viking 2 and Viking 1 here and here. We have uh, Mars Pathfinder with its little rover sojourner. We've got Opportunity here, and this landed in 2004, and its twin Spirit, which also landed in 2004. And uh, Opportunity is actually still going. And uh, recently, uh, or we are just going to be uh, completing a marathon with Opportunity. We have traveled 26.2 miles with Opportunity on Mars, which is really, really, we're very proud of. If, if we're not there yet, we will be within days. So we're, we're very proud of Opportunity still going. Um, its original mission was 90 days. Um, and that was in 2004, and it's recently celebrated its 10-year anniversary. So we're very proud of Opportunity. Unfortunately, Spirit got stuck in some sand, and we haven't we haven't heard from it in a couple of years. So one one out of two ain't bad. That's pretty good. Uh, Spirit Spirit uh, completed its, its mission and went way beyond as well. So um, it it can it deserves a rest definitely. Okay, and then we have uh, some um, these these uh, other craters here. Um, these other black black dots with white uh, spots in the middle are, um, there were four craters initially examined for Curiosity to land within. Um, and so those are the other three. And we are currently examining those as potential candidates for going in on Mars 2020 as well. So they're looking at uh, potential landing sites, but um, we're, we're definitely looking at, at some options, other options as well. This figure down here is also another digital elevation model. Uh, it is showing Curiosity, the crater. Uh, you can see the crater rim here, uh, again, with the, the red orange uh, indicating high. Um, and then this blue moat, this low spot right in the middle here with the uh, indicating low. Uh, and then you can see this uh, red dot right in the middle here. 
which is a mountain in the middle of Gale Crater. And that is what we're really interested in, is going up this mountain. So uh, right now we're at the bottom, we're in the blue. Um, this is a really neat infographic because in 1976, the, um, this is comparing landing ellipses and their accuracy, uh, starting with the Viking um, landers and going all the way to Curiosity. So uh, the Viking uh, in 1976 had an accuracy range of landing of about 174 by 42 miles here. And then we have Pathfinder here, which is about 125 by 44. Uh, we have Spirit and Opportunity here. Um, I can't quite read that. I think it's 33 by 12. Oh, excuse me, 83 by 12. We've got Phoenix, which is 2008. And then Curiosity, 2012, which is a 12 by 4 mile radius that we were able to land in on a planet thousands of miles away, millions of miles away, very far. It takes eight months to get there. So, I mean, we were able to land within a 12 by 4 ellipse a 12 mile by 4 mile ellipse. That's just amazing. And uh, from there, we're building on our technology. Every time we send something up to Mars, we build on our technology, and we're getting better and better and better. Um, more efficient. Just, it's, it's just really great the showing um, how, how much better we're getting. OK, so uh, Gale Crater, we've got this mountain in the middle. So let's talk a little bit about that mountain. Here, uh, here's Gale Crater, right in the middle here again. Um, this is showing the uh, northern lowlands and the southern highlands. So uh, I was mentioning that dichotomy between this really low blue area that was very flat and featureless, and then this uh, cratered high area. Um, so we have red and yellow are high um, elevation here, and we can see all the craters here. And then you have this line right through the middle here. It's, it's very linear. It's, we, we're not sure why. Um, and then you have this sort of smooth low, lower area up here. And Gale Crater is right in the middle here, uh, just right along the edge. And uh, the hypothesis is, is that Gale Crater actually was filled with sediment uh, at one point. Um, and uh, you can see all these craters here are full. They're, they're basically filled in. They're soft. Um, they have sediment up to the brim. Uh, but Gale uh, has actually, all the sediment has blown out. It's been exhumed. And you can actually see, um, it, it's, uh, you can see the crater floor here. And this white area indicates very, very low. Um, so this is the lowest point in this image, other than this little white spot here. Um, but when we're looking for uh, water, which is one of our mission objectives, uh, we want to go to a low spot, because just due to gravity, water collects in the low spots. Um, so here, this is one of the reasons why we chose Gale Craters, because in that entire area, it's one of the lowest spots. And so if we're going to find water and, and prove that it's there, we're going to look in the low area. Okay. And here we are with the mountain in the middle. Uh, so this is Gale Crater again, up in the upper uh, left corner here. We have the crater rim right along the edge here. We have uh, north is in that direction there. Uh, we have this mountain right in the middle. Uh, and uh, we have this moat uh, around the, the bottom of Mount Sharp. And there's these little dark features right in here on either side of the mountain. Uh, those are actually uh, really mafic sand dunes. So they're really, uh, they're basaltic in composition. They're like dark, ho like Hawaii type um, basalt. And um, they are sand dunes that are kind of blowing around the side of the mountain here. So you'll see these sand dunes in other images. So um, use them to orient yourself to where we are here. Uh, and this bottom image down here, uh, here again is the mountain. And then there's those dark sand dunes right in front of the mountain down at the bottom here. So how big is that mountain? Well, here's a scale. Um, and apparently, my image moved here. Um, but it's about half the height of Mount Everest. So this large gray feature here is Mount Everest. Uh, we've got Mount McKinley here. And then we have the orange is Mount Sharp and uh, Mount Rainier down here. So it's about 5.5 kilometers high. Um, and it's about uh, the entire crater is about 150 kilometers across. And uh, what we believe was that since Gale Crater was filled in with sediments, that this middle mountain uh, is uh, leftovers of those sediments. Um, and our goal is to uh, climb up that mountain and read the, the layers of the geologic history uh, within Gale Crater and going up Mount Sharp and to recreate the geologic history of Gale Crater. And hopefully that will really help us understand a lot about Mars. Okay. 
And so one of the other reasons that we chose Gale Crater, in addition to it being very low, where water would most likely collect, uh, there was a feature here that I've outlined in blue here um, that looked very similar to an alluvial fan on Earth. So if you go out into the desert, uh, Anzaborago Desert, and you look at the mountains, they're, they're very steep, and coming out of the canyons onto the valley floor are these fan-shaped debris piles and uh, usually you need water to move that uh, sediment. It's very coarse sediment, very large grains, and uh, wind won't blow that. Wind has been the major erosive feature on Mars for billions of years, but wind isn't going to move rocks this big. So what we're seeing from space are, um, is a, a, a very, it's a fan-like feature what we see from space, and so the hypothesis was is maybe that's an alluvial fan. So when we look to see if it is an alluvial fan, we're going to look for big rocks and big chunks and uh, stuff that the wind wouldn't blow and only water could move. So remember that for our future slides. Oh, and one other thing. So we, uh, this is our landing ellipse right in here, this black circle, and uh, the star is where we landed, almost right in the middle. And we were very excited because we landed right at the bottom of this fan-shaped feature. So, bam, right there, we were there, we didn't have to drive anywhere, we could just look around us and see what's going on. Okay, um, briefly I wanted to cover Curiosity's uh, primary scientific goal because um, this, is, this is the point of us going to Mars. Uh, we wanted to um, assess um, a local region, aka this small area, on Mars's surface as a potential habitat for life, past or present. Um, so one thing that's important to know about Curiosity is that we don't have, unless we find a fossil of some sort, there's uh, no way that we're going to know if life was on Mars. We have the ability to figure out the chemistry of the rocks, we have the ability to figure out the mineralogy, so we can see if there's oxygen or potassium or uh, silica or you know anything, we can see what the ingredients are. Um, but we are carbon-based lives as, as we know it, and so we could find carbon, so we could find the ingredients for life, but we wouldn't actually be able to put any of those together to assess that there was something living. So the next mission, uh, 2020, uh, we're, we're designing so that we could uh, attempt to uh, quantitatively define or find life as we know it. Um, 2020, uh, Mars 2020 um, rover is also um, designed to be a sample caching mission where we'll take the samples and we'll store them and then at some later date when we have better technology we can go get them and retrieve them somehow and use those to assess them on Earth with our methods that we have on Earth. Um, so one thing we're looking for is biological potential, so the ingredients for life, um, the ingredients that life needs to survive on, some sort of energy source, uh, water is a big one. Um, we want to understand the geology and geochemistry of Mars, because again, we also want to figure out what happened to Mars uh, in its geologic past uh, to compare it to Earth and sort of see what happened. Uh, we want to look for water and uh, weather. We also want to assess weather um, just for science, and also if we ever send anyone out there, uh, we're going to want to know what sort of elements they're dealing with. Uh, and that includes radiation hazards. So if we, uh, we have a, a radiation detector on board, um, and it measures uh, radiation from the sun and also just from cosmic rays um, to, for uh, astronaut safety so we can design for if anyone is going to Mars they can use that data. Uh, so it's very cool and uh, in, actually in our first two years we have measured radiation, we've uh, shown water, we've looked at the geology and geochemistry and uh, we've assessed that uh, there are carbon, there is nitrogen, there are essentially the ingredients of life. So we'll talk a little bit about some of those here, but in the first two years of our mission, our prime mission, we have completed all of our mission goals. And so just the, the past couple months we started our uh, first extended mission, which is uh, we've renewed our contract for another two years to continue working on Mars. Um, it's about two Earth years to one Mars year. Um, so we've completed one Mars year, just over one Mars year, and uh, we're going to keep going and our, we're going to go up Mount Sharp and try to get a lot more data. But uh, we're all very proud because we've gotten so much data and so many results just within the first two years. So uh, we'll get more. Okay, and uh, I didn't want to go into detail too much on this slide, but I just wanted to show you the um, scientific payload. Uh, payload is essentially what we call all the scientific instruments that we have um, on our Curiosity rover. Uh, so we have the very famous ChemCam here with its, its bright, shiny laser, 
Uh, fun fact is that usually you can't actually see the laser beams. Um, sometimes you can see a flash of light down at the ground where it's actually ablating the minerals, but um, this, is, this, is not, this is CGI right here, that, that red. Um, here's our cameras up here. These are the mass cams. Um, this is what my company uh, built and runs. Here there's uh, one on each side there, kind of like two little eyeballs. Uh, then we have the Molly, which is my camera. You can't see it because it's on the back side, um, but it's the hand lens imager. It's on the turret. And uh, we have some other tools here. We've got a drill. This is our little drill that drilled that hole. Um, we also have the radiation detector on board. Uh, here's the descent imager. It's underneath the rover looking down at the ground because when we came down at Mars, it was looking down at Mars. Um, we have our sample analysis on Mars, which is the mass spectrometer. Um, lots, of, lots of cool instruments. We've got the REMS, which is the environmental monitoring system. So that's where we get the weather and the winds and the temperatures from. Um, very cool. Okay, and so once we landed, um, and hopefully everyone was stayed up really late that night because it was only 11 o'clock when it landed. Um, I know people in New York stayed up, so uh, we landed amidst, um, amidst much fanfare, and we used this uh, neat contraption that hopefully you've heard of, which is called the Sky Crane, uh, which actually hovered about 40 meters above the ground and lowered Curiosity down to the ground. Um, and it uh, had these thrusters that made it hover above the ground that were super high powered. Um, and it actually blew up a bunch of dust on either side of us. Uh, and it, it blew all that dust up onto Curiosity. So we, we, came, we became very dirty after we landed. Uh, so next time they'll probably pull it back just a little bit. We don't need quite as much power. They really gave it a lot of power. It was almost a little too much, <laughs> a little too much. Uh, but they didn't actually know how it was going to work until they got there. Curiosity, it's about one ton. Uh, they say it's about as big as a Mini Cooper, and the mast is about seven feet high. So it's pretty big, but not too big. Okay, uh, so here we have our landing. This is where we landed. We uh, turned on all the cameras, and we looked around us and took some pictures. And uh, here's the mountain in the background. Uh, you can see it's sedimentary layers. Along the front here, you can see some, some layers. You can see these nice dark sand dunes right in the front. You want to get oriented. Uh, and you can see, again, these scour marks here um, that we blasted away all the, the sediment, that uh, the thin dust on, on top of it. And uh, we looked closely at what those scours looked like with using the mass cams. And we saw this, which was very exciting, because um, if you um, can look very closely, you can actually see rounded pebbles. Uh, so this is 20 centimeters, which is about 2 thirds of a foot. Okay. Okay, so these are, these are big little, little rocks in here. You can see little rocks that, that are sticking up here in this layer here. Um, and we're very excited because uh, when you see rounded gravel, pebble-sized rocks, that usually indicates that you have a higher energy environment. Something made those rocks travel and become rounded. Um, so most likely you had water that was moving those rocks because air can't move something that big. The wind can't. Uh, and then um, see it in a rock formation right at the bottom of that uh, weird fan set type feature that we saw. Um, and right away you have a conglomerate on Mars, which indicates that you had water um, flowing down through, through Mars. So uh, then we said to ourselves, um, well, if you have water, definitely, we've confirmed that there's water moving these rocks and rounding them. Uh, we want to go to the lowest spot again because water moves to the lowest area, and uh, see if we can find where that water collected. So this is the canyon. Uh, this is north is up. We have Mount Sharp down in this lower corner right here. We've got those dark sand dunes, um, these linear features here. They're not colorized in this picture, but you can sort of see some sand dunes coming up through here. You have this canyon right here, which you can see really well. And unfortunately, unless you're looking really closely at the screen, it's hard to see this fan. But this is that alluvial fan that we're talking about. So we landed right at this dot here, kind of right at the base of, of all those features. And we went right over here to this little dimple right here. It was only about 500 meters away. And uh, we decided to uh, go to that area, just a little jog over, and uh, see what we could find. It's, it's one of the lowest spots in the crater. Um, so here is our landing site. You can see the mess that we made with those thrusters here. You've got two scours on either side from those thrusters coming down, and then all of the dust that we kicked up in all the both directions there. 
Um, and then we drove, you can see our little tracks here, right through here, and then that's Curiosity, uh, really high albedo, it's reflecting up um, at the, this is the high-rise camera which is on one of the orbiters, uh, it's a very high resolution camera. Uh, and we went down into this place called Yellowknife Bay. Uh, so it's hard to see right here, but if you look very closely, kind of right here in the lighter areas, um, you can kind of see some uh, weird polygons um, that we're calling this the uh, bedded fractured unit. So it's sort of a low area with these weird polygons in it. Uh, so we decided to go down into Yellowknife Bay and see uh, kind of, I mean, it almost, it almost looks like a little lake, right, with the little the little rim here, you see it pretty well. And immediately, this is what we saw at the bottom of Yellowknife Bay. So we found mud cracks on Mars. We, we went down into Yellowknife Bay and we found mud cracks, so more evidence of water. We found so much evidence of water. So uh, yeah, we, we went and we looked really closely at these mud cracks and we decided to do some drilling in this area because everyone obviously, I was just excited right then, everyone was super excited when we saw these pictures uh, after we took them. Um, so we looked really closely. This is the, um, this is on Mars here. Uh, these are some pictures here. Uh, these are little veins, little white veins that we saw within the mud cracks on Mars. Um, and we took this with the ChemCam remote micro imager, which has really high resolution. It can get in really close. Um, and uh, so we took some pictures of that. And then if you pop over here, you can see um, this feature right here, which is not very Martian-like. This is a Swiss Army knife because this, these are on Earth. These are very similar veins on Earth. So we actually analyzed these veins using the ChemCam instrument. And uh, we found out that they're <coughs> calcium sulfates. So does anyone in, in, interested in geology know what uh, the, a common name for a calcium sulfate is? Gypsum, exactly. We have gypsum on Earth and we have gypsum on Mars. Very cool. So this is just a great example of how we can uh, use Earth geology um, to do geology on Mars and also a great example of, of how we know what's going on on Mars by using Earth examples as well. Uh, so everyone is obviously very exciting. Um, so this indicates that um, with mud cracks, usually it indicates an environment where you have your water drying up and uh, leaving behind those cracks. And uh, gypsum um, usually forms uh, as an evaporate as well. Uh, it's, it's considered a salt. Usually you find it out in the desert quite often. Um, so the, from the environment that we know gypsum forms in on Earth and also the mud cracks and also the, the gypsum uh, essentially indicated that you had a standing body of water, potentially a shallow lake, uh, where there was evaporation occurring and these salts were forming and uh, your mud cracks were forming once all the water went away. Um, it also indicates that you have probably a similar environment to what we have on Earth. It was probably a relatively pH neutral, it wasn't too acidic water. Um, and also the temperatures are probably very, you know, comparable at the time, you know, not too hot, not too cold, um, but where water is in its liquid form and uh, it is evaporating. So it kind of gave us a, a really good indicator as to the environment that we were looking at. So we decided to go a little bit closer and drill. So again, here's those nice green colors that we're talking about, kind of the greenish gray, and then we have a thin layer of, of this red oxidized um, dust on the surface here. And uh, this is a mini drill. We like to test what we're doing first before we actually commit to the full drill. And uh, this, this, there's no scale on here, um, but this, this, this looks pretty huge on this picture. However, this drill hole is only six centimeters deep, which is about the length of your index finger, maybe a little bit shorter than that. Uh, and the hole is the size of a dime right here. So it's really tiny, it's not really that. It's like a drill from your garage, you know, a really big one, but um, it's pretty low tech. So here's the drill bit right here. Uh, it spins and a sample is extracted and it kind of goes up the sides of the drill and it goes into the turret uh, and then we go through a whole sampling process and uh, here it ended up in the scoop here so we, uh, we are showing kind of a, a sample in the scoop. And then we put it into our uh, various analyses machines on the rover including the, the SAM and the Chemin. Um, here's another example. So if you go back to the previous one um, you see the hole is shadowed right here. So what we like to do is uh, do an angled image where you can see the side. And this worked out so well. This is actually an image that I took. Um, and you could see the vein going down into the rock. So everyone is also very excited about that. But it's very 
pretty. It's very pretty. Ooh, ah. Okay, all right, that's my bragging. <laughs> well done. Okay, so we put it into the, uh, the Kemen instrument, which looks at the mineralogy of the rocks here. And uh, this, these are two um, sample um, results here. The one on the left is uh, a, we took a, a sample of a sand dune, a uh, sediment in a sand dune that we found on the way to Yellowknife Bay. And we ran it through this uh, chemistry and mineralogy. And uh, all these little lines indicate a different type of mineral. And so what we found in the sand shadow is that the minerals are all very similar to uh, basalts, uh, basaltic type composition where you have a lot of magnesium and a lot of iron, um, some feldspar. Um, and um, that was what we expected uh, because that's what a lot of the surface of Mars is. But when we went over to uh, test the Yellowknife Bay sample, uh, we got this weird little signal right here, so this light spot, and everyone was very excited because those were clays. Those are phyllosilicate clays. And usually clays form, again, in an environment where you have a lake, fine grain sediment. Uh, you have water trapped in those clays usually. <coughs> but overall, it was confirming that we had this, this quiet, low energy environment where clays are forming. Very exciting. OK, and then we stuck it in the SAM, the sample analysis of Mars, which is a vast spectrometer. Uh, and uh, SAM cooked it. And uh, these are some of the major um, uh, major gases that we found with SAM. Um, so the big thing here is that um, this guy right here, which is uh, H2O, many of you are familiar with, that's water. Um, we had a really big water signal, um, which indicates that there is a lot of water on Mars, it's just bound up in the minerals uh, on Mars. Uh, so then we also had some carbon dioxide, we got some oxygen, um, we've got some um, hydrogen, you know, we've got some, uh, these are all uh, types of gases that you'd associate with life, with, you know, us, us we didn't have a lot of oxygen, um, but uh, with life as we know it, these are the type of minerals that make up life as we know it. And so, uh, right away, first sample, we were able to confirm that there is biological potential out there. I mean, these are all minerals and, and elements that, that are familiar to us on Earth here. So, so um, at Yellowknife Bay, um, we found an ancient habitable environment. It had water. Um, there was a potentially an ancient river system. There was a alluvial fan. Um, we had the mineralogy indicating that um, the liquid wasn't too um, it wasn't too salty. It was uh, relatively pH neutral. Um, you had chemical key chemical ingredients for life are present, such as carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And then. Um, this is something I didn't really cover. Um, the presence of minerals in various states of oxidation would provide a source of energy for primitive organisms. So all this red uh, round, all this red dust uh, indicates that your uh, sediments have rusted. There, any iron in them would have oxidized, and so uh, they became reddish in color. But that blue, uh, the, the blue, the, the greenish gray, uh, indicates that that hasn't happened yet. And so the fact that that process does happen indicates that you have some sort of energy uh, occurring that creates that, that oxidation process. So the fact that you have that potential for energy, and there are life forms known on Earth to live under those types of conditions that, that use that energy to survive. So uh, there is potential for that energy for organisms to, as we know it to, to live up there. Okay, so uh, that's sort of our first conclusions of our prime mission, uh, where I said mission completed, check. Uh, that's some of our evidence. Um, we uh, completed basically our prime mission right next to the landing site, which worked out really well because we designed that landing site to try to maximize our mission returns. Uh, since then, we have traveled about eight kilometers or about five miles to this little yellow star here, uh, taking nice pictures along the way, doing some good science along the way, but mostly we were, we were driving very quickly. And so driving very quickly on Mars, it's about 0.1 miles an hour. So it took us about, uh, took us about a year to get here. Um, <laughs> hey, whoa, what are you laughing about? This is, this is proud. Uh, so our, <laughs> our goal is to, um, for the extended mission, our goal is to kind of get up right about here. So that's uh, by next September, hopefully, we're, we're right up around here. Um, so right now, we're at the lower reaches. You can kind of see this little white unit, trace it along here. We're hanging out in this lower white unit, 
uh, trying to find out more information. So this is also, um, you have the crater floor here, you have this white unit here, which is actually below the crater floor. You, the, these little, these are little cliffs here that are from the crater floor on top of this, this little white unit here. So it's also a low area. Um, and we're finding some really cool, uh, cool data. Uh, so here's those sand dunes that we were talking about before, those little dark sand dunes. And then here's a, a canyon that our goal is to drive up um, this, this canyon, and it kind of goes up and gets deeper and bigger as you go. Uh, but we're actually designed to handle some really high angles, like I think up to 40 or 50 degree tilt. Um, we haven't tried it yet, so let's hope that it works. Uh, we're, we've gotten up to 20 degrees, you know, in, in some, some cases. Uh, they, the rover drivers like to play it safe though, so we'll see. It'll be interesting. It'll be very interesting. Um, so our goal is to kind of come around and, and, and avoid a lot of these dunes. We'll stop and scoop them and analyze them while we're, while we're there, but we'll, we'll kind of go to this little sandless area and start to head up the, the canyon there. Here's kind of a zoomed in version. Uh, so here you have uh, the location where we are currently is called Parump Hills. Uh, so we're so close to those dunes, but we're still uh, we're still relatively far away if you're going 0.1 miles an hour. So we're going to kind of drive around and, and come up here. Um, so we're looking again. This is that white unit here. Uh, this is the crater floor here. Um, let's see. So we are now entering our first extended mission, where we'll begin the traverse up Mount Sharp. Uh, and this is a little ridge here that we're going to be looking at. Uh, so one of the reasons why we chose this area and why we think uh, Mount Sharp is so important. So uh, if, if anyone has taken a geology class, um, I hope that you have seen a geologic time scale, which is a very convoluted time scale that includes the Jurassic, Triassic, Cretaceous, uh, all of the time periods that go back 4.5 billion years in the Earth's history. And there's been a lot of research done. And so there's a lot of breakouts into smaller and smaller time periods where you have, you know, maybe not 500 million years, it breaks into 25 million years, and breaks into several thousand years. And it gets complex and complicated, and you have all these different ages and all these fossils, and it's crazy. Uh, Mars has the Noachian, Hesperian, and Amazonian. Three. Three breakouts in a 4.5 billion year time span. So the, this one is uh, just over, just under three billion years, the Amazonian. This is the most recent time where essentially Mars is, is dead. It's considered dead. It's kind of the red, rusty planet. Um, you don't have a lot of impacts. Um, there's a little bit of volcanism. Um, cold, dry Mars as we know it. But before that, Mars had a very rich history, um, which we're only speculating about. Um, and so we have this period where, um, before that, the Hesperian, where there are um, a lot of volcanic eruptions going on. And so if any of you have ever been to Yellowstone or anywhere where there's a lot of uh, um, geothermal uh, activity going on, uh, if, if you remember, there, there's kind of a smell that goes along with those. Does anyone know what smell I'm talking about where you have? Sulfur. What does that smell like? Rotten eggs. Yeah, sulfur, rotten eggs, yes. So uh, during that, this time period, the Hesperian, um, you had a lot of volcanism. That was when those really huge volcanoes on Mars were really active, and there's a bunch of others around the planet as well. So you have a lot of that sulfur going out into the atmosphere, and sulfur uh, is acidic, or can be acidic, um, and so that, you're getting a lot of deposition of, of sulfates during that time period, so you have a very acidic environment. Um, and then before that, uh, is, uh, you have this, in this blue areas here, you have about... Uh, Five billion years, or excuse me, 500 million years, where our Mars looked like Earth, and that's where you have these clays being deposited, like the ones that we found in Yellowknife Bay. Uh, so it was a very nice, water-rich environment, potentially very much like Earth. Uh, you know, you probably could have lived there at that time, based on the evidence that we found. So um, during this time, again, uh, with Earth, like with Earth, uh, Earth was uh, hypothesized to have formed during a lot of uh, impacts and asteroid impacts and it got bigger and bigger and those uh, uh, planetary bodies accreted and Earth eventually became as big as it did. Uh, so the hypothesis is, is that Mars formed around the same time and you have a lot of uh, bombardment and a lot of crater impacts on the surface during that time period. Um, but that is also when we had this warm wet Mars. So we went from nice warm wet, probably with a really nice atmosphere here, to volcanic eruptions and a more acidic environment and then cold dead, dry bars. Very sad. Um, so remember this, clays, sulfates, and then anhydrous ferric oxides. 
And uh, we're going to apply it to this figure right here, which, if you might recognize, is, again, this picture of Mount Sharp that we're going up. So here's that canyon right through the middle here. Uh, there's those dark sand dunes kind of behind. Uh, we're at Parham Pills, which is just right here. Um, we use a, a machine called the Compact Reconnaissance Imaging Spectrometer for Mars, right here, CRISM, uh, which is essentially an um, imaging spectrometer, so it looks for minerals on the surface of Mars. And uh, what we saw are uh, clays down at the bottom here, down at the bottom of Mount Sharp. And you start going up Mount Sharp and you see sulfates here. And so just this section right here might help us confirm that entire geologic time scale, you know, a couple billion years back at the beginning of, of, of Mars uh, formation. So we're really hopeful that where we're going right now is going to tell us a lot about how Mars formed just in the next two years. We're really, really hoping. Um, it's going to be a challenge because there's a lot of rocks and just one rover. Um, if I was up there, I could do a lot more, but unfortunately, that's hard. So I would like to avoid that, actually. Okay, so um, this is what Mars, what Gale Crater was hypothesized to have looked like over four billion years ago. Um, we see our lake sediments, we see our alluvial fan deposits or our river deltas. Um, you, it's essentially a lake. It's a filled in lake. Here's a CGI. This isn't actually how it looks. This is CGI. Um, so it would be a, a lake right in the middle of your crater. Uh, very similar to all the other craters around us. There'd probably be similar lakes. Um, but then you have the sediments around the edges eroding away uh, through weathering, mechanical and physical weather. Oh, excuse me, physical and chemical weathering. Uh, mechanical and chemical weathering. There we go. Um, and all the sediments were washing into the low spot. Uh, and they were collecting in the sediment basin. Uh, so here's our crater wall right here, another CGI. And our sediments were kind of collecting. And you have, uh, you can see our layers in here, this bowl. Um, and through time, uh, Gale Crater has been exhumed, or all the sediments have blown out of it. Um, the hypothesis is through wind action, about four billion years of wind blowing and abrading those sediments and, uh, and moving those sediments around. And so what we have here is we have uh, Mount Sharp in the middle and all of our nice sedimentary layers on the edges here. So that is what we're, that's our current hypothesis. And as we go up Mount Sharp, we're going to try to recreate that geologic time scale. We're going to try to create the, the climate. We're going to try to recreate what happened you know, with, within Gale Crater and what happened uh, just with the geology of Gale Crater specifically. And so already we're finding a lot of evidence that potentially our hypothesis is true. Um, we're already finding that alluvial fan. We're finding the lake uh, evidence. Um, we also have... Um, southward tilted sandstone beds on the plains. So this is just the crater, the bottom of the crater. And you have uh, sandstone beds um, that are kind of this, this area right in the middle here, where you have your sediments flowing in from outside the crater, washing into the, the lake, that, that lake that we were showing, um, and, and leaving behind sediment deposits. Um, and so uh, here's uh, some other pictures uh, to sort of support that. We're seeing a lot of cross bedding right here. Uh, which indicates that there was a current of some sort. Uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, planar bedding, which indicates uh, less energy, uh, less of a current, but still you're getting uh, inputs of sediments. Uh, here's some other cross strata here. And uh, these are really fine scale. Uh, this is the scale down here. These are really fine scale laminations here. So they're indicating layers. They're indicating you're getting sediment coming in, some energy. So you do have potentially these rivers, these lakes, um, as we're driving by and finding that. So already we're finding really promising evidence. So very quickly, I wanted to share with you guys some results that we've gotten recently. Um, so this is that light tone unit right at the base of Mount Sharp that I was pointing to, um, this really flat lying um, light unit. Uh, you can see Mount Sharp in the background there. You can see the sand dunes, so close, but so far. Um, and then there's this overlying unit here that we're gonna be driving up next. Um, but we drilled this unit down here. It looks very similar to Yellowknife Bay. It looks like a mudstone, which is what Yellowknife Bay was. Um, and uh, here's our drill samples right here. Uh, we actually cracked the slab, but that didn't stop us. We kept going. Uh, and this, um, you can see under the Martian sunlight, looks a bit more reddish. But if you take a picture of it at night, we have some LEDs on the Molly camera. Um, it is kind of a, a grayish color still, which is what we expect. Okay. and. Um, why we drilled this area is because we uh, brushed it. There's a brush on the turret, and uh, this is the, the color um, 
of the rock. At, and this is at night. This is a nighttime image using those Molly LEDs. And if it's, it may be a little hard to see in the back, but there's these little white things in here all throughout the sample. There's one right there. They're, they're about rice size. They're a little bit smaller than rice. Um, so we brushed this off and we decided to drill it because it had all these little little lath, crystal laths, these little features, little crystalline features here. Uh, and so everyone again got really excited because like at Yellowknife Bay, um, gypsum, which is, there's a picture up here, is a um, really fine scale, uh, creates those same crystal forms in basically a very similar shape. So everyone said, oh my gosh, we can confirm what we saw over there and you know, compare our results and it'll be great. So they decided to drill, they decided to use the ChemCam instrument, they decided to use Chemin, and they found out that those little white things are not gypsum. Ooh, so the plot thickens, ha ha ha. Um, they're actually seeing, uh, they're seeing a lot of uh, potassium and iron, um, which, which corresponds to a mineral called jericite, which we often find at acid mine drainage sites forming. So it, it indicates a very acidic environment. So uh, you have this, this environment that looks similar to Yellowknife Bay, but something changed, something was different. And so here's Jerosite here, you can kind of see the little crystal faces here that you can kind of see how they compare there. Um, so the question is, um, was, did this Jerosite form when the rock was forming, which indicates that when this rock was forming, it was maybe during that volcanic period and you have all that sulfur occurring, or did water that had um, a lot of iron and potassium in it uh, flow through this, this rock unit at some point later, or maybe you had a lake later that came in and formed these minerals on top of that rock or within that rock. Um, so are they primary formation or secondary formation? And this is actually something that came out last week. So this is what we're currently investigating right now on Mars. Uh, so these are the type of questions that we're, that we're uh, investigating. Um, so more to come, and it's getting very exciting, and uh, stay, stay tuned for more. Thank you. I don't know if you saw this when it was moving. It's a, a GIF of us. Um, we took a selfie, and then we oh, nice. moved the mass, and we took another selfie. <laughs> and then we just we just put them together. It was actually these only these four images that we retook was was those. And you can also see um, on the ground here, little little stuffs happening. So that was kind of our nerdy fun. I see. Um, I see one question here. Out of curiosity, uh, oh. you, <laughs> what? Just, just out of curiosity, uh, um, what, what do you think about like the Mars One mission? The Mars One mission? Um, no comment. <laughs> It'll be interesting. Sorry, one question in the back there. Yes. It's kind of a similar because there was an article in yesterday's paper about a woman in Chula Vista that wants to go to Mars, mm -hmm. willing to go on a one-way ticket. Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be. I guess one study, you have to bring everything with you. One of the studies that recently came out was that if someone does go to Mars with our current technology, they'll only survive approximately 68 days. So they'll survive the eight month, eight to ten month trip out there and, and survive for three months. Less than three months. Yeah. Another question? Great trip. Yes, uh, two questions actually. Um, what, if any, uh, potential fuel sources are being investigated and using that's been using mineralogy um, that could be extracted in order to form a future return mission to Mars. And two, how does that sample analyze or sterilize itself? So you're talking about the uh, like the battery power that we have for the rover? No, is that what you're referring to? What I'm talking about is what minerals can be or are being investigated that they can extract from the ground that could be used in the future as a potential fuel source for a return mission. If we send yeah. humans to Mars, we're going to want to know how to get back first. Mars 1 is kind of a joke. We've been yeah. able to go to Mars since like the 60s, The real engineering and, and frontier pushing it comes from being able to come back from Mars. Exactly. That's where, that's where the real... Uh, yeah, and NASA, NASA won't send a mission until we're able to come back. So the minerals that we're finding now are basically very similar to the minerals that we have on Earth. Um, very similar. Uh, and that is, is one thing that we're establishing in this mission is the mineralogy of Mars. And so uh, knowing that, um, there probably are minerals here that we can exploit. Um, and I suspect, you know, once, once mining companies find out about those, they'll be very interested in funding. But um, right now we don't, we're, we're just establishing what those minerals are. So we're, we haven't gone beyond that at this point. 
And the second, what was your second part of the question? How does the uh, sample analyzer or the SAM, how does that sterilize itself? Uh, it, t high temperatures, really high temperatures. It, it has to spend several days cooking until, and then until it's ready for the next sample. And even then, you know, it's, it's, it's hoping for the best um, because even on Earth, you know, you never know if you have contamination or not. There's no way for us to really check it. Um, we have designed it so that it, it ideally it, it is sterile. Um, but I mean, just atmospheric, you know, wind blowing and stuff. Maybe you know, it, it's supposed to be airtight, but you never know. So, yes. Uh, sorry, one question over here. Yeah, well, what, what is sorry, I have two questions? What, what, what is the atmospheric pressure on Mars? What is the average surface temperature at the equator? Okay, uh, average surface te uh, pressure on Mars. Uh, the atmosphere is about one third of that on Earth, um, and so it actually depends on the time of day because when the sun is on. Uh, shining, your atmosphere actually warms up and expands, very similar to you know your car tire. If you're driving, your your air expands in the tire, so um, you actually have more protection during the day when your uh, atmosphere is warmer. Uh, if you're a human going out there, um, the average temperature uh, at the equator during the um, the first 90 sols, which I believe is during the winter, you're talking about maybe positive. T uh, Barely positive uh, Celsius um, to about negative 90 Celsius or something. So you definitely want to bring a jacket. It's going to be cold um, during the summer. I haven't looked at the recent results. Um, we just went through the summer, so it's, it'd be warmer than that. But it's survivable. You definitely want to bring a couple of coats. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> right back here. Yeah. As a technologist, I'm interested. In who actually designed and put together the yeah. the rover itself? The rover itself? Sure. Uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, under the direction of Caltech. Um, Designed, they, they created the, the, the design for the rover and they put out the calls for proposals for all the different instruments and components and parts and then they assembled it and put everything together. So uh, they put out a, a call for proposals for the cameras and so we answered that with our um, uh, proposal for the camera and they um, decided to buy our camera and so we made it and then we gave it to them and they put it onto the rover and sent it all up and so everyone else did that as well. Right in front. What's the latest thing about the possibility of plate tectonics on Mars in the past? Yeah, I think that there's a lot of evidence for plate tectonics in the past. Um, they do have um, the lower portion that's very cratered, um, that high, the northern, uh, the southern highlands um, have a very strong magnetic signal, magnetic reversal signal, which indicates uh, very similarly to um, Earth, which uh, with our mid-ocean ridges spreading and our, our parallel uh, magnetic signatures and reversals and whatnot, they have evidence of that in that southern portion. But they don't in the northern portion. So that's, that's part of that argument is that what, what, why doesn't that have that? So, in the back, yes. What did happen to the water? That's what we want to find out. So That's nobody has a theory on it yet? Um. Is that I, related to the atmosphere, the lighter, uh, the lower atmosphere? Well, they believe it happened at the same time. That, that something happened where Mars lost its atmosphere and water, and they believe it's about that same time, about, you know, four billion years ago or so. But we don't know how or why, so we're, that's one reason why we're investing. And there's theories out there. Um, I don't have them all with me or listed. I haven't studied up on them at, at this point. Yes? Are there ice caps at the poles? Yes, there are. They're both carbon dioxide and water ice caps. Um, the carbon dioxide ones are seasonal, um, so they, uh, when it's uh, warm, the carbon dioxide sublimates into the atmosphere, and when it's cold, it hardens right away onto the surface. Question. Why Mars? Why not like Venus? Why for why are we going forward towards the sun? Why are we moving back? Well, we have a lot of probes going to all the planets. So this um, Mars is the most Earth-like. So I think there's a lot of interest in it as potential source for I don't, I don't know. Calling it going to at least is, is the next one. Uh, it's 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 survivable if we went there. So that's just it, like survivability. There's a lot of other reasons. Yes, I mean it, it's also I mean it's it's. It's very similar to Earth, so we're hoping to learn a lot about Earth. Um, people can actually go there, it's, so it's manageable to attain. Um, it's got really interesting questions uh, regarding it. Potentially, it had water. It's within the habitable zone. So there's a lot of reasons, but it's, ultimately, it's similar to us. And before we kind of go beyond that, I guess, is, you know, it'd be nice to understand something similar before we go really different. But we, we're studying everything, so yeah. Uh, on the way back. The uh, crane that lowered the curiosity, uh -huh. it, was it retrievable or is it now just... It's gone. It, it cut the cords and it went and crashed. 
<laughs> Same question, yeah. Uh, the time scale that you have there on Mars, is that based on relative dating or have there actually been any kind of absolute dating? Relative dating, although funny that you should ask, we actually uh, used the sample analysis of Mars mass spectrometer to do some potassium argon. Dating. They found potassium and argon in the rock sources, and it was a brand new experiment that they didn't realize that they could do, and so they tried it out on Mars, and uh, the dates actually confirmed about a four billion year age for the crater. So we have an absolute date on Mars. Right in front, yes. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning, uh, 2020 new rover missions. Mm -hmm. What will be the major uh, new capabilities the, the rovers are going to add to the existing? Um, so, let's see, um, there is really a new suite of instruments and the goal is to, um, it's, it's going to be chemistry, a lot of chemistry, but it'll be slightly different. Um, uh, there's, there's about 20 instruments and unfortunately I, I can't recite them off at this time, but um, it, it's out there. They, you, you can go look, look up what those instruments are and what they're doing. Maybe the same kind of a landing scenario. Oh, the scenario yeah, for landing? Yes, yep. They're going to use the same technology and because and, uh, it was successful. We've proven it, it works. So, the, I mean, I'm sure there'll be slight modifications. Like the, the thrusters might, they might just tone it down a bit because they tossed up so much stuff onto the rover. It got really dirty. But yeah, we'll yeah, it, it is very power hungry, definitely, especially with the mass spectrometer. So if you remember, Opportunity and Spirit had solar panels, and anytime there was a dust storm, their power got cut. And just over time, their power was really reduced um, just because dust has accumulated on, on those panels. Um, so they decided to go away from that for this rover, and they're actually using a, a thermonuclear generator. Um, and so that's this, uh, this thing right in the back here. And uh, it's, uh, it's essentially a battery that, you know, it, it provides power for the battery over time. It's uh, supposed to last, um, I, I think, something like 80 years, and, and it'll, it should last longer, but it should last really well for, for at least time. So we can go. I mean, all of our parts have been tested, and, like none of them have failed. So we're hoping, we're hoping that we go much, much longer. 80 years, hopefully. I'm curious why, why they are not designing armatures that can actually dig up a fossil. Um, what is the probability of, of this, this of curiosity actually being able to find a fossil? Yeah, it'd have to be at the surface because it's really difficult um, to dig. I mean, right now we're, we're managing with a you know six centimeter drill bit. Um, it's, it's basically superficial at this point. I'm not sure about the development for future deeper. Um, actually, the, one, of the, one of the instruments on the next rover is um, a GPR, a, a ground penetrating radar. Nice job. Yeah, so we're hoping to get some subsurface data. Um, it's, it's, it won't be that deep, but it, it should be. It's definitely better than superficial. It's better than six centimeters, definitely. Yeah. Uh, you can just do a Google search uh, for the landing video. It's called Seven Minutes of Terror. It's a good one. And for the... Uh, <laughs> And for the for the um, the Marty the actual video where we took um, uh, pictures um, in quick succession and showed the landing of, of Mars, you can just do a Google um, like Mars landing or something something like that. You, it's, I'd Google it and, and put you know Marty M A R D I is the camera name, um, so that they should people put it together. All the images are down, so everyone can look at them and use them and see them. Yes. If we wanted to keep keep up with the new development of the next rover, would that information be open to the public uh, for, for engineering students that are interested in seeing what's going on on cutting edge? Yeah, they have uh, they have news releases every now and then. Um, I'm not sure how much of it is public at this point because they're still really in development. Um, but I would um, JPL. Um, has you could sign up for their their newsletter. They have a day in the news at JPL every now and then where they talk about updates. Um, not just it's it's all of their their projects, um, but every now and then something comes out about Mars 2020. So and if they have a news um, a a press conference or something, that they'll usually announce it as well. But I, I just visit the JPL website because it, it's like new information, news releases. That's how I get a lot of my, my information because I'm so far in the trees that I, I need to see the forest sometimes and, and that's how I, I go there and I'm like, oh, what are we doing? Oh, interesting, yeah. Yes? Uh, how often do you guys release photos? Uh, we release it continually. Um, data comes down and we, we 
push it right out. We have a pipeline that comes out. Uh, the raw images are also on the JPL website. You can just go to the MSL website and there's a link for raw images. Um, a lot of times, um, I mean, they're reddish, right? They haven't been white balanced, so they're, they're not pretty to look at. Um, so some people on, uh, there's forums and whatnot, they process it and they talk about it. Uh, unmannedspaceflight.com is where all the nerds go. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> so all my coworkers. <laughs> And, and hopefully some of you guys will go check it out as well. But those guys actually are the ones that they, they like stay up at night and they'll make products of, of our products. And uh, they'll be like, oh, look what I did. And, and we're, we're like, wow, that's really cool. Thanks. That's cool. Uh, based on the data that we had collected of the site before we got there, um, we've, we were right. So um, there are several other craters, as I pointed out at the beginning, that are, are potential for uh, future landing sites for the 2020 rover. Um, I'm not sure about the 2030 and what they're planning for where, but uh, we've definitely established that we're doing the right thing. So hopefully we build on that. Yes? Did you guys have any other hiccups on the mission besides the dust picking up on the rover? Um, yes, actually, one of the um, environmental monitoring systems, we had two, um, you can see one of them, this is right with the landing as well, you can see this little sort of knob sticking out from the neck here, um, there are two of these little sensors, uh, they were at a 120 degree angle from each other, and uh, they were supposed to measure the wind coming from you know, the east, west, north, south, or just two different directions of wind. Uh, monitoring and they're also supposed to be redundant to confirm measurements that each one were taking. Uh, so one of them, something happened to it during landing. We don't know what. We took a picture of it. It looks fine. So maybe it got hit by a rock or something. I don't know. Well, it landed. That was the major hiccup. Everything else is really. I got a knock on wood before I say it's gone really well. Like super. Everyone. Everything has been working. It's, it's just been really great. Yes. Okay. This is less of a question and more of a plug because you asked this question. Uh, if anyone's interested, you should follow NASA social, there are any social media accounts and they host these NASA social events. Yeah. And if you follow it, they put up, uh, every time there's a launch or event, they'll put up this, this uh, not a raffle, but this opportunity for you to win a trip. You have to pay for your travel. But I won two years in a row and I got to go see the Mars Atmosphere Volatile Evolutionary Explorer launch Mar uh, Maven. November 18th. Yeah, yeah the Maven uh, 18th. And we actually got a four day tour behind the scenes and everything, and they addressed that exact problem. Like when the dust came on, we got to go to the lab, the Sunworks lab I think it was, and we saw how they they added the coils into the uh, into the solar panels, that they sends a jolt and it knocks all the dust off. So we got to go in the labs backstage and, and for days and hang out with the astronauts and engineers. So awesome. follow them and apply to those things, because you can win a free cool. trip. It's really cool. Watch and watch. Yes. Is there a delay? What's the, I heard there was a delay when you're like, when, that, when you're driving, yeah. The distance. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it it changes based on the distance of Mars from Earth and and uh, and whatnot. But um, average is about 14 minutes there, 14 minutes back. So we won't know for about 30 minutes if something happened. Um, usually we aren't. That we call that ground in the loop. So before we make a decision, uh, we wait for the data to come back down. Uh, one of the challenges for that is that we have to either have direct connection of the rover to Earth. Um, or we have to have the satellites, um, you know, over the top of the rover getting the data and then the satellite, the orbiters transmitting that data back down. So it's hard for timing. You really have to plan something like that. Um, what we usually do is we tell it what to do over a 24 hour period. Uh, so we spend our eight hour work day uh, deciding what Curiosity is going to do, uh, then refining and we check. At, we, we spend like four hours checking everything before we send it up to the rover because obviously we don't want to break it. So um, we first half of the day we, we plan what we're going to do, second day we check, second hour we check, second half we check. And then uh, we, we bundle it all up, we send it up, Curiosity wakes up, she goes over here, takes a picture, does this thing, does an analysis, takes another picture, and then goes back to sleep. Um, and then the data gets, you know, the orbiters come by and they, they collect the data and then they transmit it back down to Earth while we're asleep. Um, and then the next morning we have the data and we figure out what Curiosity is going to do the next day. Um, so we don't, we don't quite use the delay. We, that really mattered when we were landing, obviously, because we really wanted to know <laughs> if it worked. Yeah. Yes, follow up? Your question? Yeah. There was an article, I'm not sure if it's a rumor or not, that you found um, evidence of fossilized bacteria. Is it just a rumor or is it just confirmed? You, if NASA finds anything, you will find out because that is our mission. 
that is what everyone is working toward is is finding this this life and so it's a rumor until like until you know it will we will be the first to let you guys know that that it is happening because everyone is going to freak out and be super excited about it and of course we'll have to then of course test and confirm and scientific method you know everything and, and before it becomes you know before we can actually uh, know for sure but we will definitely yeah it's everyone at NASA is going to be so excited if, if we find that definitely. Uh, was there a question up in front? Oh, I just had a question yeah. about uh, picking the Gale uh, landing site. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that probably it was based on some good remote sensing data so that yeah. when you all went to Mars, you expected to find sedimentary rock there in, in the central. Yes, yep, yes, that is correct. Yes, we had really good orbiter data. The high rise camera, I think, has like meter resolution or something. Can, so can it's 10 meters. You can, you can see bedding. You can see the bedding on, on uh, Mount Sharp. Yeah, from space. So, yeah, it's beautiful. Okay. All right. I see people heading out. So, if you have questions, feel free to. I'll stick around for a little while. And uh, yeah, thank you.